Hey, welcome back. Uh, this is session number three of Mass and Storytelling with Spark AR for Culture Hub's collab series. I'm Ashley Jane Lewis, and this session is all about mass as cultural expression. So we're going to be thinking about histories and your ancestry and all of the things that make up where your family comes from and how mass have been a part of that story. So the first thing I want to talk a little bit about was uh, is, is cultural appropriation. So in this series, I just want to encourage you to really dig into your own roots and your own heritage. This is such a great opportunity to do some research around where your family comes from, ask a family member or a friend who has a similar background, and think about how you might use this opportunity to learn a little more about yourself. Um, so I'm going to show you some examples that I'm really uh, intrigued by and that are associated to parts of my heritage and you can do a little googling to find those same kinds of things for your heritage as well to make a mass that's about yourself. Um, so I also want to talk a little bit about how easy that will be. Um, realistically mass have shown up on this planet in every nook and cranny for every culture on the globe which is really exciting because not too many things seem to you know food and dancing and music seem to like you know touch all the corners of the world but it's really exciting that mass also show up in like irish culture or, you know jamaican culture african culture japanese culture korean culture uh, you know first nations culture and uh it's really exciting to see how uh how these different places of approach mass, but let's look at your own history and your own culture and take a glimpse at what might be applicable for you to make a mass for your own cultural expression. Um, so I have a bunch of examples I want to show you from artists that I really like. And I spend a lot of time thinking about black futures, as, I, as I've mentioned a couple of times. And so all of my examples also um, show a similar kind of interest. You know, as a result, I also spend a lot of time thinking about black histories. And so uh, the cool thing about mass is that they seem to show up in our depictions of the future and the, of course, depictions of the past as well. So let's take a look at some of these examples to get started. Here are some examples of work that I think would be really helpful for us to look at in relation to cultural expression. These two artists I'm about to show you really take elements of their own cultural history, fold them into new methods of expression, and create modern art with them. So the first person is this artist here on the screen, Adiyemi Adegbazan. And this is an artist from Toronto who goes by Young Yemi on Instagram. As I said, I get most of my inspiration from Instagram. And uh, this image that we're looking at is a, um, a graphic that's been plastered onto a wall in Toronto. Um, and you can see, because this is standing height, we can see a lot of the detail. So um, when I stood next to this image, I was like about this tall or so, I think. Um, so there's a lot going on in here. And obviously, I think that this fits into the category of mask, um, a part of our wearer's faces um, hidden. We've got all of these beautiful symbols that are uh, traditionally found in black culture. We've got these beautiful braids, these neck bands. Um, there's all kinds of different elements that have like inscription on them and detail that can be traced back to elements in the culture that Adiyemi is trying to express. There's also a lot of modern elements as well. Like this doesn't look too unlike something you might see in fashion magazines. It really feels like of this era. Um, yeah, so I wanted to show you uh, his work. Um, I think it might be really inspiring. So this is one piece. Um, uh, Adiyami also does a lot of illustration. So here's a piece of illustration. And you can see again, like elements of the past and the future brought together. So you can see this jewelry, which is like very closely related to things that we see worn, you know, today. Um, some like fonts that are similar, but then some patterns that draw from history. 
uh, and uh, some technology almost. It looks like this could be some kind of technological set of glasses, things that you know are projecting into the future while drawing from the past at the same time. Um, Ariyami also does photography of physical masks that he makes as well. So this is an example of that, um, an actual physical piece that's worn by the user in these photographs. And here's just a whole bunch of his illustration. Um, really beautiful collection of work, each one expressing different kinds of culture elements and different kinds of like approaches. Look at the Supreme logo here from, you know, our 2020 world. Um, and I think that this is just like such a great example of how you might blend, you know, history and um, the present and perhaps the future as well. So that's Adiyami's work. The second artist I wanted to show you um, is named Lao Yu Senbayo. And so this is an artist who is Nigerian, but based in Brooklyn, New York. Um, so he's a visual artist, a singer, songwriter, musician, human rights lawyer, activist, so many different kinds of identities, and really well known for this facial painting, body painting, that he has developed as a part of his aesthetic and style. So this is riffing off of, you know, a cultural expression, um, in black culture uh, and you know adapted into a modern presentation of body art you can see some more examples of it here um, and so yalu has really worked with every celebrity under the sun it feels like um, here's an example of his work with serena williams who uh, had her face painted for her essence magazine cover and this is like a sh very short, like, you know, example, very short list of what's extraordinarily impressively long, uh, I guess, in the collaborations that he's made with like other artists and celebrities and, you know, other kinds of performers as well, dancers and um, musicians. He also has his own face filter. So uh, let me go to the beginning here. And you can see here, you can even try his own filter um, if you wanted to. So he's done the transition job that we're kind of trying to model here, where he's taken uh, like a aesthetic that he draws and paints and then turned it into a, a digital filter too. So these are the examples that I wanted to show you. I hope they've been inspiring. Um, so that's it. Okay, so now that we've gotten a chance to look at some really cool examples online, it's your turn. So do a little Googling about how masks show up in your culture. Think about how you might want to look at those aesthetics and play with those aesthetics. Maybe talk to a family member or a friend and ask them how masks might have shown up in your history. Um, maybe even in their like personal family story, masks have a, have a, a moment in that narrative. Um, and take a second to draw out what you want your mask to look like. So it can borrow some of the aesthetics from your own mask history. Um, it could be a depiction of the future of your identity and your culture. Uh, it could be a nuanced component of your culture, perhaps like a depiction of the way that music makes you feel or the way that a particular artist makes you feel. Whatever it may be, draw an illustration of it in your notebook and then write a small story that goes along with it. So just like we looked at with these artists online, most of these masks tell a story about who the wearer is and what that shifts for them when they wear the mask. So ask yourself, if you were to wear this mask, like who are you? What does it change about your relationship to like confidence or to, you know, your self-esteem, maybe your masculinity, your femininity, your non-binary identity? Um, what does this mask change about the wearer and who are you when you wear it? Um, so after you do your paragraph story and your illustration, um, we're going to take a tiny slice of that, just like we did last time in the video before, and we're going to apply that into Spark AR to try and create a version of it in a face filter. So um, I'll meet you over there, but do take a minute to do a little research and to create that illustration and that story.
Welcome back to our Spark AR system. Um, we're going to make a new filter today, and today's filter is about cultural expression. So I thought that you could use some of the things we've already done and maybe pair them with today audio and face interaction and some text. I was just thinking about how, you know, sound and music can often be things that we love about our cultural heritage and text can help you convey a story or convey information or details about your background. So we can play with both of those today. We're actually also going to do a little coding today, which is exciting. So um, just as a reminder, uh, the video here, you can see my mouse circling this video. It's not going to link up with what I'm saying because it takes a little while for Spark AR to process video. So don't worry, your computer's working fine. Just an extra reminder. So um, like I said, you can go and do some of the things um, that we did before. So for instance, like you could go add an object, um, add the face tracker, and then add a face mesh. I'm gonna go quickly because we've gone over this a couple of times. And here we are, we've got my face mesh, as you know. Inside of the face mesh I, uh, inspector, you can add a new material. And then that generates our material over in the assets folder. We would make it face paint or whatever kind of material you wanted for this particular mask. And then like, of course, you can add some textures. Um, remember some of the textures that I've added before. We've got like this galaxy background, which is cool. You can change the opacity. Right. Um, you can go to Pixlr, as we said in the past, and you can create your own graphic for this. Um, you can even write with the pen tool in Pixlr or the text tool and tell your story and export it as a, you know, save it as a graphic. And then you can use that as a mask if you wanted to. So for instance, this is something that Octavia Butler, a black female science fiction writer, um, wrote in her journal. It's a very popular image all around like perseverance and, you know, staying true to your creative craft. And you could, you could like export that as a filter. So you have like writing on your face, which might be interesting in order to like talk about your culture in a way that's really visual, whatever you'd like. Um, but for now, I'm just going to turn off my face mesh so that we can focus on these new elements for the day. So I've just taken my face mesh and turned it, turned the visibility off by clicking it here. And now let's go into some code. So before we start, you need to go grab a, uh, a coding text interface. So this is just like a place, it almost looks like a Word document where we'll write some code and send it to our Spark AR studio. So I've just brought, grabbed a couple that are um, maybe interesting to you. This is the one that I use. This is Visual Studio Code. So you can see the name of it here in the tab. This is the URL, of course. And you can go grab that one. It ends up looking like this. Um, so you can grab that if you want. Um, you can also use Atom. Atom is another one which is really good. You could use Sublime, which is another text one. You can see some examples of like the way that code looks if you've never seen it before. Yeah, so all three of these would be great. Um, they're all free and available online. So go download whichever one you think you might like. Do a little, you know, looking into the ways in which they work. Um, but I'm going to use Visual Studio. So if you want to follow along with something that looks just like what I'm doing, you can download Visual Studio code as well. Okay. So um, the action that we want to do today, I thought this would be kind of cool, is um, I want to use the face tracker in a way we've never done before. I want to use the face tracker to detect uh, a area of our face to control some sound. So naturally, if you're thinking about like sound and the face, the thing that probably comes to mind is the mouth. Um, so we're gonna use a little bit of code to get some data off of your mouth and then use that information to play and pause some audio. So when we open our mouth, the audio will play, which will be kind of fun if you think about like maybe using like a audio file of somebody singing or talking. 
Um, and then if you close your mouth, uh, if you open and close your mouth again, it will stop the file. So um, I think that will be fun and maybe like open up a little bit of creative, creative opportunity for you. Okay, so to work with coding in Spark AR, it's pretty fluid. We're gonna go back to the assets area. So code is considered an asset in Spark AR. We're gonna go grab a uh, new asset by adding the plus sign at the bottom of the screen. And we're gonna click script. So another name for coding, like a series of lines in your code is a script. So um, you can see here, it adds this new asset in the scripts folder called script.js. JS stands for JavaScript. So we're working with JavaScript today. So you can keep that name, that's fine. We're only gonna use one script file today. And now the cool part about this is that to open the script in Visual Studios, you don't have to go to Visual Studio to do that. You can open it from Spark AR here. And of course, like from now to the end of the video, at any time I say Visual Studio, you can just swap that for whatever coding interface you're working on. So if you're using Sublime or Atom, you can like obviously just in your head swap um, my reference to video Visual Studio to, with uh, whatever you're using. Okay, so you can double click this file here, or you can click edit in the inspector and it will open up a tab with the same title as your script. Okay, so we have a lot of text here. Um, as I said, here's the name of our script. And in Spark AR, here's the name of that same script again. So these two, these two things are designed to match, um, which is great because we don't have to go find that file in our computer. So there's a lot of code here and you don't have to feel too worried about it. We're not gonna use most of this. Um, and most of this is just information for us on how to use code in Spark AR. Um, but I'm, gonna, I'm going to explain a lot of this so you don't have to feel too intimidated or intimidated at all about what you're looking at. Um, so the first thing I wanted to say is that we have a lot of green text here and depending on the coding interface you're using, the text you see might be like gray or, or something else. And I want to ask you why you think there might be so much green or gray or like, you know, code that is not <laughs> colorful. Um, for our code, when we're writing code, there's two kinds of text we can write into a coding IDE. And the first is a set of instructions for your computer. So this one is probably one you're more familiar with. This is like how you uh, will tell your computer to like click a button or like activate a web page or, you know, play a sound in the case that we're doing. Um, so all of those lines of code are likely going to show up if you're using Atom or Visual Studio or Sublime will show up in like a multicolored line. So this, for instance, on over here that I'm highlighting is like an actual line of code for our computer. The other kind of text that we can write in here are messages to us, ourselves or other coders. And those are the ones that are showing out in this case green, but like grayed out or uh, uh, slightly lighter color than the rest of your code. So the way that we write a message just for us is by starting the line with two slashes. So let's take this line over here, for example. It's green or in your case, maybe grayed out. And um, the line begins with these two slashes and the message is welcome to scripting in Spark AR Studio. So that's just something for us as coders, it's a message that another coder left for us. Um, that's something the computer is going to ignore. So anytime we start a line with these two slashes, it's something the computer will ignore. So if I get rid of these two slashes, for instance, you're going to see all of these red squiggly lines underneath the words because the computer is proofreading this code and saying, I don't understand this instruction. So if I put these two lines back, it's going to disappear because now it's just a message for us. Um, as we go through the code, I'm going to be referencing different lines like I just did. And to help us like both be on the same page, um, we're going to look at the line number and reference the code by the line number. So the line of code that I just talked about is actually line number six. There's like a light gray number on your left hand side. And that'll help us all know where in the code we're referencing. 
Okay, so now that we're here um, and we've gone through the system of like understanding how we write or what these two kinds of lines mean, um, we can delete a lot of what is here. So I want us to delete everything below line 18. So everything down from line 18, we can just get rid of. We're not even gonna look at it today because all we're trying to do today with our code is one thing. We're trying to track the movement of our mouth so that we get a number based on how open it is. So for instance, if our mouth is closed, we'll get the number zero. If our mouth is like fully open to its widest, we'll get the number one. And anything in between there is going to be a decimal number. So um, if our mouth is half open, we'll get 0 0.5. If our mouth is a quarter open, we'll get 0 0.25, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, we're trying to use this code to send, um, to send that data to Spark AR so we can use it to trigger an audio file. So before we go any further, um, I just want to show you where that number is going to show up. So inside of, um, inside of our Spark AR Studio, we're going to show the console and that's where our little number is going to show up. So if we go to view, we're going to go to show or hide the console. It's going to open up this new section. So the console is like the secret communication line between the functions inside of your computer, the like hardware software inside of your computer and you know, us as coders. So this helps us send and receive and understand messages from our computer um, and understand and communicate with the code that's running underneath Spark AR. So it's gonna show up right here. We're, we don't see it yet. We haven't written enough code to launch it yet. Okay, let's go back to um, our code. So we have one line of code so far. This is the first line of code on line 17. And the code reads const scene equals require scene in um, quotations. So what do you think this line of code means? Are, are there any pieces of this code that we can remember from Spark AR? So the word scene is something that might be familiar to you. If we go back to Spark AR, we can remember that this whole area here is called our scene. So you can see it's labeled as such and everything that we've added so far fits inside of the scene. And so uh, the scene in our code is referencing all of these areas inside of our Spark AR. So there are two pop-ups of there's two times this word scene pops up the one uh the first scene is a function and the second scene is an instance so this first scene in blue when it glows blue we usually get a clue in visual studio that it's like a part of the way that spark ar is written which means that spark ar has a bucket in its coding for any scenes we want to run and this blue word scene is referencing that bucket. So it's got like a spot in the bits and bytes for any scenes we want to run. It's like a container for the scenes. This word scene in quotations is the scene that we are running. So I don't know, we haven't looked at it yet, but um, fun fact is that you can rename your scenes to be whatever you want them to be called. And this version we've automatically been named as scene. And so our code is referencing our particular scene. And so this line of code basically says in order to run this code, we require you to have a scene. So that's why you've got the word require here. Um, and uh, const is a, you know, a variable type that refers to something that is like present consistently in this context. So our scene is is going to be present there. Um, we also want to add a few more lines of code now. So our um, interaction that we're planning, we want our system to react to how we're moving our mouth. So there's actually another line of code we can write together. So I wonder if I can make this any bigger. Um, preferences, settings. It'd be great if I can make it a little bigger for you to see. Font size. Let's make font size 20. Maybe, oh, great. Perfect. Okay. So this is a little bigger for, for you to be able to see. So now we're on line 18 and we're going to add a new constant. So our short form for const is constant. 
And this is about reactive, the reactive nature of Spark AR. So we're going to add reactive. And we're going to tell it that we require the reactive capabilities. OK, so reactive is another you know, set of like um, coding instructions inside of Spark AR in order to work with things like how open is your mouth and, and how can we make that into something that launches an event. We want to make sure that we're running the code that um, focuses on reactive, reactive circumstances. So we always end our code with a semicolon. Um, and so if you're getting a little error, it might be usually is that we forgot a semicolon. One more constant. Now we're going to uh, run another element called diagnostics. And diagnostics is going to be the words or the elements that show up inside of our console that give us the messages of how open our mouth is. Don't forget to use the shift with your quotation mark to get the singular quotation for all of this. Diagnostics. And we'll end that line with a semicolon as well. Okay, so if we save this, we probably won't get much in our console, but uh, um, sorry, I did that really fast. So I, I used a shortcut, Command S, to, to save the file, but you can also go to File, Save, and save the file there. And when we save it, it updates Spark AR so that um, we can now use what we've written inside of Spark AR. Okay, cool. Um, nothing so far, which is actually great. We're not getting any errors in the console either. So everything is so far so good. Um, oh, we're missing one more. Sorry, we're missing our face tracker. So the other element that we want to um, add is our face tracker so that uh, we can use our, <laughs> of course, face tracking software to detect the mouth opening and closing. So we've got face tracking, require face tracker, tracking, sorry. Here we go. Cool. Can save that. Okay, cool. So still nothing, no errors, which is great. If we had an error, it would show up in the uh, console in red. And so we're keeping our eyes peeled for that, but nothing so far. Okay, so now what we wanna do is we want to create a variable to detect and store the information about how open our mouth is. So we need to create a variable. So to create a variable, variable again, we're gonna use our const as a short form for the, cont the container of the variable, something we want to um, hold our information inside of. And we're going to use a name for this variable. Um, let's just use mouth openness. So how open is the mouth? And now we want to think about, um, oh, this might be, I used two ends here, openness. So in case you're trying to follow along. Um, so now we have to think about like, where would we get the um, information for uh, which, like how open our mouth is. And so um, we're going to go to our Spark AR to kind of like follow the path. Um, and let's start with what we obviously know would be the beginning of this. If we're th trying to think about how open our mouth is and how we would detect that, we really need to think about, we really need to think about where that origin of the information would come from. It's probably going to come from the face tracker first, right? So um, we can write uh, face tracking, oops, tracking as our first element. Now I'm not going to save this quite yet. I'm going to come back here to our Spark AR because um, I know if I save it I'm going to get errors because we're not quite finished that thought. Um, the other thing we're doing and we want to do is uh, we want to create with this information from 
texting from the coding, we're going to create our series of blocks that helps us make the audio possible. So we're gonna do both of these things kind of at the same time because it's gonna help us. So uh, we're going to go to our view and add the patch editor. And now um, we know that the face tracker is the beginning of our origin of the information about how open our mouth is. So in order to um, start that off, we're going to hit the face tracker right click on it and add create patch. And now we have this interesting like lineup of, uh, of code, of blocks rather, that will help us with our code. So inside of the face tracker are these three blocks and uh, these three patches. And inside of each one of these patches is a little bit of code. So you can see that the face tracker is made up of first a face finder that looks for faces. See that little, we can zoom in a little bit, little gray word that says faces. It selects what kind of face or which face you want to track. And then once it finds the face, then you can have all kinds of different like outputs. We can look at the face itself as a whole, the 3D position of the face, the 3D scale or 3D rotation of that face. So this is gonna help us with our coding. So now that we know what makes up the inside of our face tracker, let's go back to our code. And we're gonna use what's called dot notation to help us connect all of these elements to get to the mouth. Um, so we can, uh, we can also see um, inside of the face, we've got like, if we added a new patch, The face has all kinds of landmarks so um, and interactions that we can use. So for instance, there is um, elements that are tied to the mouth, just like the eyebrows, the um, smile. So there's all kinds of things that can help us track them. But now we know, because we've seen it, like these things are labeled as they are. So the eyes are labeled as eyes inside of Spark AR. The mouth is labeled as a mouth inside of Spark AR. So now inside of our code, we know that our face, the face we're looking to track um, is like in our face tracker named face tracker zero. So we can go um, and add to the end of this line. So we're looking at the face tracking function. We're trying to track a face. The face that we're trying to track is face zero. So we're the first face. And then we know that we want to track the mouth. And the great thing about um, Spark AR is it has a function for openness. And that will help us figure out how open our mouth is. So let's save that first. Come back to Spark AR. It will take a second to update. And let's check our console. No errors so far, which is great. Um, okay, so uh, now let's go back to our patch editor and like back to our code. We have one more line of code to use. And this is all about, again, using that diagnostics, which will help us create some entry points into the information that we're going to be getting. So we want to use the diagnostics function. And diagnostics has a great, uh, oh, I realize I'm spelling that wrong. Um, diagnostics has a great uh, function called watch. And watch is going to display some text in our console um, that will help us look at the, inf at the uh, numbers um, that indicate how wide open our mouth is. So now we're using the watch function. We need to tell it what to watch. And we've made this great variable called mouth openness that will basically create a number from zero to one uh, as to like how open our mouth is. So all we need to do is tell it to show us that, um, show us that, uh, that number. So maybe we should just take a quick look here inside of here. Let's like save this and see if we're getting any errors. 
nothing so far, which is great. Okay, back to code. Okay, so inside the brackets, we're going to use the double quotation. Now we're going to write mouth openness and we'll give it a colon and a space. And this is what's going to show up in text as, as letters on our console. And the reason why this shows up as text and not um, indicates and doesn't indicate to the computer that it needs to find an actual piece of code inside the system. The double quotation marks is for text and the single quotation marks are for, uh, you know, instances like um, the instance of our scene. So using the double quotation marks, we're going to see some actual text in the console. And the text we want to see is the variable information for mouth openness. So now if we save that, we can come here and we've got a whole bunch of little errors here. So let's go check to see what our errors are. Oh, wow. But we, we have some errors, but we also have some working code. So here, look at what we've got. Mouth openness. Which is great. Okay, so you're, you're going to um, watch these numbers change. So I'm going to start with my mouth closed and then I'm going to open my mouth and then you'll see these numbers change. So here we go. Did you see that? So it went from zero to, uh, I think it was like 0 0.6, and that was tracking the openness of my mouth. So right now you should be able to also open and close your mouth and see those numbers change. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see, what am I missing here? This is like such a major part of coding is that you get these like weird little errors and you have to go see what um, the error is about. Um, so I just paused the video for a second and I went to go search it to Google the error. And it looks like the um, scene line is uh, slightly out of date with this new version of um, Spark AR. So I'm just going to comment it out and then save it again. And then we should get our, those errors. We actually, we, we, um, we can skip that line for the moment, which is fine. Um, okay, so uh, now we have our code working. We've got our mouth openness number going, which is really fun. And um, yeah, the numbers are really, are really going. So hopefully you have that too. Um, you can see the numbers are moving around. I'll put this back up on the screen just in case you want to take one another look to see what like typos is usually like a spelling mistake if you've got some errors going. Um, so yeah, that's what we've got so far, which is really exciting. And you can try opening your mouth, like, you know, opening and closing it. And what you want to find is the number, like rounded, rounded up, the number where you want the music to play. So my widest, um, the way the computer understands my widest mouth position to be is, let's see, Mm. Yeah, something like 0 0.7. So I'm going to make my music play when my mouth is at like, let's say 0 0.4. That sounds like nice and in between. Um, all mouths are created differently, obviously. So you might have a different number that is being triggered when you open your mouth super wide. Now this is like, you know, Spark AR is trained off of some facial recognition for a variety of different kinds of mouths. So it's just making a rough estimate as to how wide open your mouth is. Um, it's not working like directly off of your mouth, but rather trained off of a whole bunch of different mouths of different kinds of people. So yeah, so all you need to do to find the number of the midway point for your mouth is to open your mouth really wide at the camera and write down the number that you see. You know that when your mouth is closed, it's a zero, and then pick something in between for our trigger of our audio file. So um, yeah, just do that now, and then we'll come back to this, and we'll continue on to make um, some more edits to our patch editor to add the audio feature.
All right, so you've hopefully um, looked at the mouth numbers and written down the center. So we're going back to the patch editor and inside the patch editor, we're gonna create uh, a couple more patches that allow us to work with audio, which is exciting. I'm just organizing these a little bit so that um, we can make a little space. You can see everything that we do. Okay. So uh, what we need to do next is we need to enable the opportunity to work with audio. So inside of our scene panel, we're going to add another object. And this time we're gonna add a speaker. And you'll see that the speaker shows up right here, which is great. Um, and it also shows up as an object in our three-dimensional world. Um, this is something you can consider if you want to uh, consider moving around, if you want to do, um, you know, location oriented sounds, so you could like hear things if you moved this over to the left, you could hear things. Uh, well, actually, wait one second. If we move this right now, it's attached to the face tracker and the um, camera, but if we moved it below so that it was, you know, outside of that folder, like if we um, disconnected it from that folder, then uh, you could have directional sound. So like if you move this to the left, then, um, and it was playing a sound, remember imagining this a couple of videos, videos ago as a camera, we're imagining this little yellow box now as a speaker. Um, so if you move it to the, uh, to the left, then when you uh, panned your filter to the left, you would be able to, oops, simulate orbit. Um, you would be able to hear sounds over here but not as loudly over here. See what I'm saying? Okay, so I actually just want my speaker to be attached to the camera. It's gonna be coming out of my mouth, right? The audio, so it would make most sense for that audio to be um, attached to the camera. So I'm gonna move this back inside the folder So that now it's also attached to the face and I'm just gonna undo what I did before, which is move it away um, and bring it back to the center where my mouth is. So now if I orbited my camera, simulate orbit, if I orbited my camera, you see the speaker is stuck to like my mouth area. So that's where the audio will be coming from. Um, okay, so now that we have a speaker, um, you can see on this side, we have uh, uh, volume control um, and uh, we have some features in this area. We're also going to add a uh, new asset in the assets area. And this asset is called audio playback controller. So this will help us determine how to, um, what audio to play and how to play it, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, so now that we have that, we're going to go over to the audio inspector. So we are, we've collect, clicked on the audio playback controller. We're in the inspector and we're going to import, uh, we can import a sound from our computer. Um, so you can import an audio file from your computer if you want. You can also go to the assets area, add um, something from the AR library. So if we go to the library, there's a section here for music and sound. And there's all kinds of sounds that are just available for you to import for free. Um, so there's a hundred, there's more than a hundred in this list. And there's also some sound effects, some ambient sounds, some music. Um, so click whatever you, click whatever category or element you want. Um, I believe in my memory, the sound I was hoping for is in the electronics section. Let me turn this up. Um, e, C, just scroll in for the E section. Lots of classical music. Um, oh, cool, a classical choir would be fun. <laughs> that would be fun as um, something that emits. Maybe I'll just do that, that's fun. Um, okay, so classical choir. I'm going to import that. It just sounds like something fun to add, uh, you know, because um, 
we uh, <laughs> were, you know, triggering the audio with our mouth. I'm just realizing that maybe before I import this, let me just make sure I've saved this file. It's still labeled untitled, which makes it hard to know which one we're hoping for. So I'm just going to save this real quick. Culture Hub module three, um, sound and text. Okay, now it'll be a little easier to know which um, file to assign it to. Let's go back to music and sound. Sorry, everyone, I'm just going to scroll again to the C section. Bum, bum. Uh, classical choir, I think it was called. Cool. Cool, this is the one. Oh, that's fun. Okay, so we're gonna import that to our AR file. It's gonna download it to our assets area. And then we can close this and go back here. And now our audio shows up right here. So audio, um, our classic choir. So we're gonna go to the speaker first. So go to the speaker and then grab the audio playback controller so that we connect the speaker to the controller first. And um, now you can see that the speaker shows up here in the used by section. And now we're gonna choose the classic choir. So now we can just test it without our mouth because remember we, we haven't like linked the audio in the mouth yet. So I can just see how it sounds with this. Fun. Okay, so we can also loop it with these checkboxes. Yeah. Fun. Okay, cool. So um, let me just turn that off for us for a second. Okay, so now that we have these uh, elements showing up, um, we're ready to now connect these two components, the mouth, who, uh, where we're getting the number of its open size from the coding script and our audio player. Um, all right, so the next thing that we need to do in the patch editor, we, we still have our face finder and the face tracker inside of the patch editor, but um, we have to grab a patch for our audio playback controller. So here in the playback controller in the inspector, um, we need to grab a patch for the play function. So I'm just gonna hit this little yellow arrow, drop it into our area. And now um, we can add some extra features that, um, extra patches that can help this feature, uh, this audio feature be triggered by our mouth opening. So what kind of patches do you think we need? If you double click on the patch area, we can pull up all the patches and just take a look at what's here. Um, and just like, I'll give you a second to just peruse this, maybe pause the video and take a look and get me some guesses as to what we're doing. We're trying to play the audio file when our mouth is bigger, is open wider than in my case, 0.4. And if we open our mouth again, then we'll turn the audio off. So I think one uh, patch that's pretty, hopefully pretty obvious is that we need something about the open mouth, right? So inside of interaction, you can go grab mouth open, add that patch. And uh, now we can connect these two. Look, we've got the face output and we've got a face input here. So let's connect these two together. See if I can back all this up just a little more so that you can see as many of these patches as possible. Um, okay, cool. Uh, great. So, um, and then uh, now that we have our mouth open, we need a patch that asks 
um, if our mouth is open wider than 0 0.4. Um, so what do you think? Which patch do you think we might need? Usually when we have to puzzle our way through, is something more than another? Is something happening or not? Uh, usually those patches are inside of the logic component. So we can go grab a logic patch, the greater than logic patch. Before we hit add patch, just take a look at what this patch is doing. So this patch has two inputs. One is the base number and one is a number to compare it to. Our output for the patch is a Boolean. And in our last video, we talked about how a Boolean is like, uh, you know, something that is either true or false. Something that is like switching on and off only has two outputs, only has two options for what it could possibly be. So in this case, um, our two options are like, is the mouth wider than 0 0.4 or is it not? Um, so we're going to use this patch and inside this output it says a boolean signal that is true if the base number is greater than the other value. A boolean data type is always either true or false. So we need to create, uh, we need to add the right numbers to find out if our number, our base number is greater than this other value. So we're going to add this patch. We want to make sure it's set to number and then we want to go to our mouth open patch. There are two kinds of outputs, whether the mouth is open or not or what the mouth openness is. So we want to grab the mouth openness output, connect it to our input and just like that you can see this number changing. So this number is changing because of the code that we wrote in the script to determine how our, how open our mouth is. So you can try opening it super wide and closing it and you'll see that number shift between zero and one um, right before your eyes inside of this, inside of this patch, which is really exciting. Now the number you're trying to add to the second one is what we're comparing it to. So how, remember that number you wrote down, like our mouth is the widest at this number and our music is gonna be triggered at this number. So whatever your patch, whatever the number is for how wide your mouth is at its widest, try and take something between that and zero to determine what your trigger point is for the music. So for me, that's a number around 0 0.4. So now that we have that, um, we are now going to add a couple more elements. Um, and so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna move these, like you already saw this, so I'm just gonna like move them over so that it's not as confusing. Maybe I'll still try to maintain the ability for you to see the patches and their threads. Um, there we go. Okay, so uh, now we wanna add a few more patches. We need a patch that tells us um, to switch on our uh, audio when our mouth is open. So we can grab another patch. We're gonna go get our switch from utilities, I believe. Yep, there she is. We talked about the switch last time. So I'm not going to talk about it too much this time. And I'm going to try and connect this patch to our flip switch. And you'll see that it adds its own pulse patch. So between our greater than patch and our switch patch, we have this pulse patch that helps us send an on and off pulse to our um, switch patch. And our last step for now is to connect this to our audio playback. Okay, so I'm just covering my mouth in order to try and avoid having it trigger without my, before I talk to you, but we should get some results now. I mean, let's try it. So the goal is now for you to open your mouth in front of the camera and see if it triggers the audio. So let's try it. <laughs> Yay, it worked. Um, amazing. So if you want that file to play over and over again, you can hit the loop here. And now, like when you open your mouth, 
it will play over and over and over and over again. Yeah, if you don't want it to be played over and over again, you can you can uncheck that. But uh, let's put this back on for a second um, because it would be great to loop that file and then have it stop when we open our mouth again. So we're gonna add one more patch. We're gonna delete this connection. And we're gonna add one more patch that switches on and off uh, this functionality so that we can use our mouth like a light switch to turn this on and off. So we just need to get one patch called not from the logic section. And this just like reverses our Boolean when we, uh, when we open our mouth. So like when we open our mouths the first time, it will start to play that file. And when our patches send it an additional signal, this not is going to say like, if the file is already playing, we're going to turn it off. The third time we open our mouths, like this not patch will ask like, is it playing? And if it isn't, then I'm going to play it. So it will never make the same decision to turn it on if the patch is already playing. And if the patch is off, it will not try to turn it off. It will only ever do the opposite of what's already taking place. So I'm gonna connect this patch to our not and connect this to the audio player. And now we should have a uh, patch that goes back and forth between playing this file on loop. Let's see. Okay, so it's looping and I'm clubbing my mouth um, to stop it from detecting the way that I speak. But uh, let's try turning it off by opening our mouth again. Yay. Okay, great. Um, Awesome. So that's that. Uh, so let me just disconnect this for a second. We can always reconnect it in order to um, start this off, but I want to be able to talk without covering my mouth about some of the other features that are left in this tutorial. And they're really simple. Um, trying to keep the rest of it simple since we just did something very complex. Um, and so the rest is just text. So I wanted to introduce you to the text function um, inside of the scene. So we're going to add an object. Let's start with two dimensional text. So we're going to get 2D text and it comes in really similar to a rectangle. Um, you'll see that uh, we're going to get some text that shows up um, in the corner. So you can see here, there's a, it's very dark, but it says uh, text. I can probably, I'll change the color to white here so that you can see it. There we go. So you can see that there's the white text here on the, on the corner. And I thought this might be a nice place for you to write your story if you want to. So we can say like, this is a story about um, my background, um, fun fact, my family are direct descendants from Robin Hood, um, like the actual Rob Roy, the person Robin Hood was based off of on my British side of the family. And so maybe in this context, I might write a story about Robin Hood, um, about Rob Roy, the original Robin Hood. Um, all right, so now you can see that I've written a, a sentence over here in the text area, but uh, only so much of it shows up on our screen. And remembering back to when we had our rectangle, um, we had to tell it to fill a particular, we had to tell it to fill the width and the height of the screen. So it comes in, as you see in this size, 100 by 100. You can choose a particular dimension for your text box, but I'm gonna choose fill width, and fill height. Oh, it, it kind of looks nice in fill width. Maybe I'll shift it down a little bit. Um, oops, that's up. 120 maybe. Shift it down a little. Maybe a little more. There we go. I think that looks good. And um, as you scroll down, you'll be able to set even more things. Like you can set a particular font, a font size, like if you want it to be left aligned or centered, 
um, the spacing, position and scale, whatever you'd like. You can even set a material for it so that it has a particular um, color. Like if I wanted to use my galaxy material, then my text is going to show up like galaxy colored, although the text is really little, so it's not going to be super exciting, but um, you can see here, there we go. It can show up like with the galaxy, the texture. Um, all right, so that's our two-dimensional text, and just like two-dimensional rectangles, when we simulate orbit, that text stays with us. Look at our camera panning on the left and that text stays with us no matter what. There's also one other kind of text. Um, in add object you can add three-dimensional text. Oops, uh, that's a 3D object. Three-dimensional text. And that will show up um, on the screen as well. And so like right now, if I rotate my screen, the three-dimensional text stays with me, it comes along with me, but I can remove it from the camera. So putting it below the microphone so it's not inside of our camera folder. So remember we can like close up the camera folder and that doesn't come along. And now um, it's going to show up as its own object, kind of like the camera did or the uh, speaker did. And so now if I move this over, for instance, if I move this over here and like bring it up a little bit, I can't see it yet, but if I, if I simulate orbit and move my screen, now I can see, you can see it like passing by my face right now. I can uh, move it behind the camera and I can show you like a, if we put it behind the camera, then we can pan all the way around and we can actually read it. So panning, panning, panning. And there it is floating on the screen. So you should see that in my little display of my phone in this interface. You can see the word text kind of like wobbling back and forth. And same sort of deal, you can change the depth or the text or what it says. Say hi. And uh, yeah, you can see it right there, which is really cool. Um, yeah, so I thought maybe this would also be fun for you if you wanted to like pan around um, and be able to uh, look around the room and see the text. Um, maybe I'll change this to Robin Hood here. Um, yeah, and so I was hoping that maybe you would use some of these features to uh, design your own mask. As you can see, each video I'm like showing you less and less of like what I would do because I want, I don't want to infringe upon your creativity. You can do whatever you'd like to do. You don't have to be influenced by what I do. Um, but these are some features, the three-dimensional text, some coding, two-dimensional text, and some audio that can help you with your, ma with your mask, your cultural expression mask. Um, and yeah, you can test it on your phone, same as we did before. And I'll put a screen recording, although it's not like super exciting, but I'll put a screen recording of this um, as it works on my phone for you to take a look at. And that's it for today. Um, great, thanks for following along. All right, we did it. So third filter, done. Um, I'm really happy that you made it to the end of this video. So uh, as always, at the end of this video, I'll leave a screen recording of what the face filter looks like on my phone so you can take a look at it. And you can choose to try it on your phone with the Spark AR app if you want to, you don't have to. Um, and yeah, now we're just gonna do what we usually do, which is continue our list of everything our computer now knows about us based on today's uh, activity. And in the next video, we'll really use that list to have a conversation um, about what we can do with some of this info. Um, and so I think that it would just be really important to think about like every feature we use today and what it might change. So we use some features that um, detect new possibilities of the face and inside of those possibilities like what info did the computer learn about us or what did it capture about us. And so add that to your list of, uh, of, of details that we've been working through this whole session. And I will see you in the next video, which is our last one, 
all about masks as disguise. So we'll talk about the list of uh, details that our computer knows about us. We'll also talk about um, masks as disguise um, and how surveillance and technology have you know, been using this information, maybe unbeknownst to us as we've been going through this process. So I'll, I'll see you over there and uh, thanks, for, thanks for doing this filter with us.